we need to resort to the original source when I want an opinion from the Maliki school, I wouldn't consult a Shafi'i book. I would go to the Maliki. If I want to consult a Hanbali viewpoint, I would resort to the Hanbali, not to the Ibadi. And vice versa, if I want to consult an Ibadi uh, viewpoint or the life or the legacy or about a big Ibadi figure, I would first go to the Ibadi literature. Peace, people, and welcome to the Real Talk podcast with Tehran and Roxana. Today, we are going to be discussing the emergence and development of what is considered to be the earliest school of Islamic jurisprudence, the Ibadi school. Despite being a school that began its formalization process in the second half of the first century AH, the Ibadi school remains underappreciated and often misunderstood by mainstream Islamic scholarship. A limited understanding of its early sources, foundational figures, and guiding principles have led both Muslims and non-Muslim researchers to unevidenced conclusions and have denied Ibadi scholars a voice in detailing the history of their own school. In order to try to offer a corrective perspective, we are very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to Sheikh al -Muth Atassam Saeed Al Moali of Sultan Qaboos University, who is currently completing his PhD on Ibadi Hadith literature at the University of Birmingham. His previous works include an extended comprehensive study of Ibadi and Hanafi jurisprudence, a seminal article that takes a multidisciplinary approach in examining the distinction between the Ibadis and the Kawaraj, and a seven volume series on Ibadi jurisprudence called Al Mutamid. Who, uh, whose first volume, The Reliable Jurisprudence of Prayer, he has himself translated into English. In his PhD work, he is seeking to carry out a codeocological and jurisprudential study of the rarely studied manuscripts of the Ibadi Hadith collection, Musnad al-Rabi bin Habib, addressing key questions regarding in its early provenance, the historical existence of its compiler and the reliability of its transmitters and the istisal between them. And I believe istisal is connection between them. Fine, yes. It's okay. Fine. And I hope I didn't butcher that. Please, my Arabic is, uh, no, but no. I'll move on. The project will uh, then focus on a case study of one of the collection's unique narrations and its current application in the growing Islamic banking industry in the Sultanate of Oman. All right. Welcome, Sheikh. And thank you so much for joining us today for what we hope will be a very illuminating discussion. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And also thank you for inviting me and having me on the show with you today. I hope I can be of some benefit to you and the viewers. Oh, no, I believe you definitely will. And if anyone's been following my channel long enough, I have uploaded a lecture from you on uh, Ibadi jurisprudence. So this is almost like a continuation of that okay. lecture, but actually with the person who's operating the channel. So I think for our viewers, it's going to be a very interesting experience. And I'm just going to start off with the first a set of questions that we have, which I believe are, I don't want to say the most important, but the first set of questions that anybody who uh, inquires the school has, and that's the Ibadi's relations to the Kuwaraj. Um, the viewpoint most people have of the Ibadi school of thought situates it as being a moderate offshoot of the Kuwaraj. But as I have come to find out, Kuwaritism as a signifier for Ibadi origins is a narrative strongly argued against from within the school itself. So where does the Ibadi school see their origins having stemmed from? And when did Ibadi as a descriptor for the school come to fruition? Okay, thank you for the question. As you referred earlier, that uh, one of the main challenges that Ibadis have faced over the course of history is the fact that they were associated with this extreme group that is called, that is came to be known as Hawarig. The emergence of the Ibadi school, in order for us to discuss the emergence of the Ibadi school, we need to, I think, go back to the first fitna of the Muslim. And that took place around in the Battle of Sufin and uh, in Nahrawan. Before that, the Battle of al gamal And um, from this fitna emerged the main uh, schools or denominations within Islamic history, Sunni, Shia, and the Muhakkim. I wouldn't call them Khawarij at, at this point because the term Khawarij 
according to recent studies, uh, is uh, as a proper noun, was used just after the second fitna from 64 after Al Hijra. Before that, there was a unified body of Al Muhakkima, those who rejected and Al Tahkim, and they call there is no rule except that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reference to the verse in the Holy Quran wa in ta'ifatan min al mu'minin aqtatan fa aslihu baynahuma fa in ta'at fa in baghat ihdahuma al ukhra faqat allati tabghi hatta tafiya ila amr Allah which basically means if two factions of the believers uh, should fight one another then make settlement between them but if one of them uh, transgress against the other, then fight the transgressing party until it returns to the ordinance of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, because they rejected a tahkim based on this verse, they were called al muhakkima And so this continued to be the case until the second fitna, which took place around the year 64 of Al-Hijra, and then when the Muhakkima itself divided and split into two uh, categories, those who decided to take uh, military or physical actions against their opponents, and the other party who decided to sit down, and that's why they were called Al-Qa'ada by the first group who were called Al-Khawari or um, Al-Azariqa, and this term developed from this time on, from that time on, as a proper noun. The history tells us that um, there was a letter exchange between Abdullah ibn Zubair in reference to Khawarij, al azariqa they were called al Khawarij as a proper noun, and his brother Mus'ab ibn Zubair as well. So from this time on, we can uh, say for sure this term is used as a proper noun for this group and by the moment that Al-Azariqa were called Al-Khawarij, Ibadis were already called Al-Qa'da so mm -hmm. Ibadis we believe they were never part of Al-Khawarij historically yes they were one unity called Al-Muhakkima but by the moment the split took place and the words Khawarij used as proper, uh, proper noun, the Ibadis, or let's say the proto Ibadi community, they were already called Al Qaeda, okay. uh, which means those who sit down, those who didn't join the fight. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's something that I found to be extremely interesting when it comes to uh, looking at the history of the term Kawadraj. Uh As you mentioned, it first became used as a proper noun regarding to uh, Ibn al-Zubair and his, yeah. his rebellion. And then came along the Azarika who took that name as a descriptor for themselves. Correct, and, yeah. and at the time that the Azarika took the descriptor for themselves, the Ibadis had already been established. And one thing that I was researching for this interview, which I found very interesting, that the Kawadraj groups, and I know uh, Karuj means to go out, uh, yes. they were all in Basra, Basra at first. And mm -hmm. if you look at the Kawadraj groups, the Najadat and the Azarka, they went out of Basra and engaged in fighting while the Ibadis stayed within Basra and, as you mentioned, sat down. And I, I think that's a very interesting point for people to um, consider when mm -hmm. using the descriptor Kawadraj for the Ibadis, that it's actually a ahistorical uh, in a sense. Yeah, I think it is not wise to use a proper term and then that developed over time and we project that back to a certain group or a certain term uh, that was not used as a proper noun at that time back in the history. Uh, there are many examples for that, even in the Holy Quran, that are not related to disputable issues. For example, let's, let's say the word qaba, the word qaba in Arabic, I mean, now we came to know the word qaba in usul fiqh to mean make up, to make up a prayer. For example, if you miss a prayer, then you need to make up that prayer. Yeah. And this, this uh, meaning is a later development. 
Mm. We cannot use the word qada with this sense to interpret textual evidence from the Quran and Sunnah in which the word qada occurs. For example, so many places in the Holy Quran, the word qada was used. It is a grave mistake to say the word qada in this textual evidence means to make up the prayer. It mm. means to perform the prayer in its time. Mm. The same with the word khawarij. For example, the word khawarij used over history before it is being used as a concept, as a technical concept, as a proper noun. In fact, the origin of the word khurug is mentioned in the Quran. And it was, it is praiseworthy in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, وَلَوْ أَرَادُوا الْخُرُوجَ لَا عَدُّوا لَهُ عُدَّ In reference to the hypocrites, if they want to go out, meaning to fight, they would have prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So here the word khuruj is praiseworthy, means to go to join Muslims in fighting and believers. And it is blameworthy, the opposite, to sit down and not to join Muslims. So the concept of khuruj in the Quran is um, praiseworthy. So mm. we cannot use uh, a term that has developed over time to mean a, a particular technical meaning and projected it back uh, to interpret it, textual evidence from, for example, Quran and Sunnah. And there, uh, there are many examples of this nature. For example, the word Shia, we cannot use the word Shia that is mentioned in the Quran to the concept that we know today. Even though people do. Uh, yeah. Well, that is a grave mistake, I believe. Uh, so um, going Did back- I miss this? I think I missed a part, uh, the second part of your question regarding oh, yes. the term okay. Ibadi and how it came to fruition. I, as I mentioned, um, the proto ibadi community, uh, I mean, started to sh take shape from 64 year of Al-Hijra. And um, uh, at that time, from that time onward, a man emerged as a follower, adherer, a tribal leader uh, of the community, as a community member of the proto ibadi community called Abdullah ibn Ibad. This Abdullah, ibn, this figure, Abdullah ibn Ibad, as I said, was a tribal leader from the Bani Tamim tribe, which was a very strong type, a tribe in Al Basra. And because of his leadership skills, because he was a tribal leader, he was nominated by the Ibadi, Broto Ibadi community, to be the spokesman of the community because um, the, the, what we believe is a spiritual leader at that time, Jabir bin Zayd, was, was hiding from the Umayyad authorities because if they had found him, they would have maybe killed him, expelled him, as they did. They, uh, they exiled him to Oman towards the end of his time by Al-Hajjag bin Yusuf al thaqafi So because... Uh, Abdullah ibn Ibad was the political, the political spokesman of the group. The Umayyads called the whole group uh, Ibadis. They named the group after Abdullah ibn Ibad. However, Abdullah ibn Ibad himself would uh, always act upon uh, the direction and teachings of Gabir bin Zayd. And the fact that we don't have any juristic viewpoint to Abdullah ibn Ibad, any theological viewpoint associated with Abdullah ibn Ibad, means he was just no more than a political spokesman for the group, a tribal leader belonging to, to this uh, strong um, group. If Abdullah ibn Ibad had uh, been the founder of the group or the community, we would have found so many narrations, we would have so many uh, political or, or juristic or theological viewpoints associated with Abdullah ibn Ibad, but you find none of that in Ibadi jurisprudence at all. Uh, yeah. 
Although I am curious, how does the alleged letters of Abdullah ibn Abad factor in the, the letters that have been, um, I believe, published by Abdul Rahman uh, al Salami? Um, they don't have, hold any bearings to Ibadi jurisprudence, to any Ibadi thought. They're just simply letters that are relevant for the period in time that they existed, but don't hold any weight in any jurisprudential thinking or view of um, fiqh or anything like that. Yes, yes. And it reflects, um, as you said, they don't bear jurisprudence, fiqh in it or viewpoints. And uh, most of them, they were political debates with the Umayyads, and also it reflects the disassociation between Ibadis and uh, what they call to be known as Khawarij. Uh, it, it reflects the tolerant policy of the Ibadi uh, school, what came to be known as the Ibadi school later on. Okay, thank you for that. I always like to ask about the letters of Abdullah ibn Abad, being that I don't read Arabic and they haven't been translated into English from what I've been able to find. Uh, but going back to the Mahakama, um, and you did touch on their slogan, La Hukma Illa Lila. Uh, do we know about any other definitive political or theological views they may have held? Um, as you know, the, the split in the first fitna was uh, purely political split. Uh, okay, it it didn't bear theological viewpoints at that time because the, the al muhakkima split from the body of uh, Safin of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the dispute was uh, political as to whether we should. Uh, stop the war or we should continue the war. So I don't think it is why to, to think that there are the Muhakkima was a group before Safin and just it split, it joined the Ali, then it split. It was part of the Ali army. Just they thought this is unfair, this is this is going against of, uh, against the Holy Quran, the clear verse of the Holy Quran, and uh, the tahkim should not have happened when we have a clear verse of the Quran. So um, I believe there were no theological disputes at uh, at this point. It was um, a dispute, political dispute, a dispute whether or not we should continue the fight. However, the political dispute developed or the theological dispute developed from 64 onward as we should we do takfir uh, to our opponents or not something which the proto ibadi community disagreed because the, the, the Azariqa were known to be the first people to uh, call their opponents as kafir. So, based on interpretations of the Holy Quran, in appears in the Holy Quran, in innakum la mushrikun. If you had obeyed them, then you would be uh, disbelievers. But um, the Ibadis uh, and the majority of Muslims interpret the verse as if you obey them in making. The carrion, the verse is talking about the animal meat. Mm. If you uh, not uh, eating the animal meat, the prohibition of eating the animal meat. So the verse says, if you obey them, then you would be disbelievers. But the the dispute is, in you you obey them in eating the meat or making. Uh, eating this uh, meat uh, lawful. So um, the Khawarij says if you just obey them in the act of eating the meat, then you are disbelievers, which means you don't have to reject the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just if you sin, you are a disbeliever. Mm -hmm. While Ibadis, along with the majority viewpoint of the Ummah, believe if you obey them, in making this uh, meat lawful, then this is a rejection of the hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going contrary to the ex explicit verse of the Quran. 
and then and only then you will be disbelievers. So it means if you reject the clear hukm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, which means you are rejecting the Quran, and only then you will be disbelievers. This is the a body view point while the azarqa view point if you just sin by eating the meat even if you believe it is unlawful you will become uh, disbelievers so here we can say a theological development regarding a takfir a body never made takfir to other muslims based on practical issues which doesn't which don't uh, involve rejection of the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, over the course of their history, they were strict, they cautioned and warned their followers not to make takfir even against their enemies, even during time of war, let alone during peace time. You know, and I think that's a very interesting point to make, um, especially if you look at the Ibadi history versus the Azarka history. If the Ibadis were as rigid as the Azarka, they probably would have died out just as fast as the Azarka did. But the Ibadis have been around for the last 1400 years. And if you look at their history, they've had times where they spread in many different regions in the East and in the West of the Islamic world. So um, I think that's the testimony to uh, a, a lot of what you have mentioned. And also, uh, just to finish on this, because a lot of people like to point out when we have discussions about the group that parted from Ali at Safin, known as the Mahakama, people always like to say that there was a call, calling them Kawadaj, but we'll call them Mahakama for the interview uh, because that's their proper name. They always try to say they have a, a Mahakama Akita. And I'm always like, uh, oh. I don't think that there was a developed Akita for any school at this period as we understand it, them today. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's just an excellent point, all of what you said. And Roxanne, if you have anything you might want to add. Uh... No, in, in just in terms of um, uh, the, the the distinctive features. So what were the distinctive features that the Hawaraj had that distinguishes them from the Abadi? So you already talked about the fact that the Ibadis um, were sort of sitting in the sense that they didn't they didn't actively uh, rebel in the same way that the Azarika um, and the Najdat did. Um, but it, apart from and obviously the the issue of takfir, was there anything else that distinguished the Ibadis from the Hawaraj apart from those two issues? Yeah, yeah I'll check if you don't mind me just uh, piggybacking off of that, and we will provide a link in the description to your article on the Kawaraj, a multidisciplinary approach. But in that article, you pointed out some very interesting distinguishing features that I think a lot of people don't consider that are a little bit more than what you had explained. Um, yeah. You know. yeah, as you referred earlier, uh, Roxana and Karen, that uh, at least in there are a number of distinguishing features between Ibadis and Kargai from 64 onwards. Because as I mentioned earlier, before that, the body of al muhakkima was a kind of a unified body. There might be some minor differences because at the end of the day, they are humans. But the real distinction between the two took place at that historical split in 64 onward when uh, the Khawarik, the Azarifa, uh, I mean, took arms, decided to take arms at that point of time. From that point of time, uh, I mean, the two, I mean, factions started branching out and developing their theology. And the distinction started to become clearer and clearer between the two main factions, Ibadis and Khawarigs, which include Azariqa, Nigdat, and Sufriya as well. Among the distinguishing features, what you have just pointed out, the historical split and the takfir issue, which I believe, and I think I mentioned that in the article you have just pointed, uh, Taryn, to that I believe that the main distinguishing feature between the two factions is the takfir one. Because when you label others as kafir, which means kufr shirk, because uh, it's it might be of great value to draw the attention of the viewers to the fact that 
Ibadis based on Quranic verses and prophetic narrations believe that takfir is of two types. Kufr ni'ma or ingratitude, which means kufr of ingratitude to be ingrateful to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by dis disobeying his commands. This is the first type of kufr which doesn't take one out of the fold of Islam. So it is equal to the, the term sinner. Kafir kufr ni'man means literally a sinner, the one who disobeys Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he remains Muslim in terms of intermarriage, burial in the Muslim cemeteries and so on and so forth, eating his meat as well. The second type of kufr is kufr shirk that takes one out of the fold of Islam or out of the religion of Islam. And it is what we referred to earlier that the, the Khawarij adopted against their opponents. So there has to be a clear distinction between the two when the reader reads Ibadi literature in particular. And this is not an Ibadi invention thing because as I referred, it is there in the Holy Quran. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes some sinners uh, as kafir, but we know as a matter of fact, they, it is not meant as kufr of shirk. Mm. For example, in terms of al-hajj and uh, in, uh, those who uh, don't do hajj to the house of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pilgrimage, uh, um, uh, they were described, this action is described as kufr, but we know as a matter of fact, they are not kafir, they are still Muslim, they are not giving the ruling of kufr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another verse uh, contrasts shukr with kufr. Shukr means to be thankful so and grateful, so kufr means here to be ingrateful. The sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there are so many narrations in which the term kufr was contrasted to the term shukr as well, and it was labeled to those who just sin or disobey the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, so this is the main distinction. And based on this, based on the takfir idea of the khawarij to label others as kafir, meaning uh, going out or getting out of the region of Islam, they made lawful for them to do, for example, isti'rab. Isti'rab is an Arabic term which means giving safety to others, then, uh, as they say, stabbing them in the back. And so this is a reprehensible act. The Ibadis never do it. While it was a common practice of the Khawarij as it was reported uh, or ascribed to them. I should, uh, before going on detailing on the other distinction, I should say here what we, what most of what we know about Al Khawarij is not derived from Khawarij literature, is derived from their opponents' literature. So that's why we should be careful when we ascribe any characteristics to the Khawarij. We are just dealing with what we have of literature. This is the literary Khawarijs, and as we know them from their opponents' literature. Unfortunately, we don't have much literature of the Khawarij themselves that was written by their own hands. Just as we denounce the idea of deriving or taking information about Ibadis from opponents, also we don't take for granted whatever is written about the Khawarij by their opponents. Because Al Khawarij faded or died away quite uh, early in Islamic history, we don't have much literature about from some poems attributed to them. So we should be careful when we deal and when we ascribe to Khawarij some actions or belief. But as I said, this is what is reported about them. The notion of isti'rab, for example, 
like uh, uh, and another notion is that of uh, hijrah as well it was described to them that they asked their people to join their camp to do hegra or migration to their camp this is one of their ideologies as well as uh, uh, doing kufr by just sinning to commit a sin is to commit a kufr based on the interpretation of the verse i mentioned earlier so mm -hmm. this is one of their distinguishing facts yeah and the that... bodies don't agree what Definitely, definitely. Um, and like I mentioned, you have a fantastic article distinguishing going into more detail that we will leave a link in the description for more people to read it. And a lot of what you mentioned about the narrations concerning the Kawadaj that are prophetic and then also the heresiographical uh, literature. And when I say are prophetic, you know, quote unquote, um, what do you think of the narrations allegedly attributed to the prophet concerning the Kawadaj and their characteristics? Because that's one of the main things that people bring up when we talk about Kawadajite history is, well, the prophet said such and such. And then sometimes they attribute Kawadaj characteristics to a person, Dual Kawesera, who isn't, yeah. when I read the Hadith, don't seem much like a Kawadajite to me, but it seems like you know, there's a bit of reaching going on. Um, how, how do you, would you respond to that? Being that uh, this interview, the crux of this interview is on Ibadi Hadith. And I'm wondering from your research, what have you found about those Hadiths that may be problematic or there might be some truth? Yeah, my research didn't tackle these issues in particular, but I can give my brief answer to it. I mean, which I derived from uh, quite a recent study uh, I'm drawing on this recent study, famous recent study by uh, Dr. Nasser Al-Sabi. It's called Al-Khawarij and Al-Haqiq al ghaiba which might be translated roughly as Al-Khawarij and the Absent Truth. And he came to a conclusion, although he didn't mention this statement in his book, he mentioned it in other articles that he wrote. I'll, I'll translate this conclusion. He made it in Arabic. He said, الصحيح منها غير صريح والصريح منها غير صحيح. الصحيح, which means the sound narration, the intact narrations are not explicit. Hmm. Just like that of Dul Khwaisra, you just referred to Dul Khwaisra narration. Although the origin of this hadith without the additions, uh, the old additions is sahih, is intact. In fact, it is in Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi'a, Hadith al-Muruq, we call it Hadith al-Muruq, some call it Hadith al-Hawl. It is the origin of this Hadith is in many collections of the Hadith, including Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi'a. So this uh, Hadith of Dhul Khuwaisira is intact, no doubt about it. But it is not explicit on a certain group. So we should not, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, each faction can apply it to their opponents from what is their, uh, they read Quran, but they don't apply the Quran. So each faction can apply it to use it to label their group as the, as the hadith being applicable to them. And to continue to carry on was minha sahih and the explicit narrations that mentioned the word al khawarij in them, the explicit prophetic quote quote, the explicit prophetic narrations that mentioned explicitly the word al khawarij are not sahih, they are not intact, they are not sound hadith. Like for example, khawarij kilab al nar, for example, and many hadith, in fact. When I go, sometimes go into deep reading these so many narrations, I got sick from <laughs> the drama, sorry for using this word, that was tailored to fit a particular groom. And let me get back to the Hadith Dhul Khawaisara. I said, cautionly, the origin of Hadith Dhul Khawaisara is uh, sahih, intact. However, it seems there were later additions that were not mentioned in the authentic narrations. 
uh, that they were added to this narration, which seems uh, to be later invention, like the idea of the, the Thadiyya, this person, the Thadiyya, that the Prophet mentioned at the end, towards the end of the, the hadith of Dhul Khuwaisara, and that Ali ibn Abi Talib asked to look for the Thadiyya, and they found him among the people killed, among the people of Nahrawan. Mm. As Sabi himself, uh, did the great task of going to almost all narrations of Dhul Khuwaisara, and he found that this particular edition is shad, we call it, like odd. Mm. It is not mentioned in the narrations that are uh, authentic or more authentic. So um, in the science of hadith, we have two terms, mahfud and shad. Mahfud literally means memorized one or preserved one, intactly preserved and shad it means odd so when you have uh, so many narrations so many authentic narrations that don't mention uh, a particular addition then we have uh, one narration or a few narrations that uh, that mention that addition uh, then we call this addition shad mm. if these narrations that added this addition are sound in itself they are called shell be, because they contradicted the mahfoud narrations. However, if this addition is brought up by uh, unauthentic uh, narrations, like the case with many narrations that brought up the idea of, of the thadinya, then we call it munkar. It is denounced hadith. Not only it is just old, but it is denounced hadith. So as sahih the correct or sound narrations are not explicit. They can just, they can be applied to many groups over the course of Islamic history. And as sarih the explicit one that mentioned the term al khawari are not authentic. They were later inventions. Thank you for that response. That makes sense. No, no, definitely. It makes sense. Uh, well, I'm pretty sure it will make more sense when people look into it. But thank you for giving us those gems on the scholarship that is behind that Hadith, because uh, I don't think a lot of people know that just from reading the Hadith from whatever collection they find it in, that there's a lot of variations and things may have changed and additions as well as it really doesn't fit the description of the Kawadaj uh, when you look at them from a historical sense, what we understand of them. So thank you for that. Particularly as it's used in quite a polemical way, just in daily discussions now between Muslims. So, for example, if you if you question a particular leadership or you um, you oppose a particular government, then you are often labelled with that hadith. Right, that hadith is invoked. So, I think yeah. it's really interesting to to understand that actually that hadith might yes. the authenticity is highly questionable. Correct. It is interesting you referred uh, this uh, term khawarij. It has been used over the course of its history for those who go against any just ruler or just opposing even verbally any unjust ruler. While the fact before the split of the Khawarij, before al muhakkimah Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan himself went against Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this took, uh, and he took military action against Ali ibn Abi Talib. He killed in Safin. It is said around 20,000 of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and at Tabi'in. And so he wasn't called Khariji, and he isn't called Khariji. And until today, most Muslims, including uh, many who are associated with Sunni Islam, they believe Muawiyah was a Baghi. I mean, I mean, uh, who went against Ali ibn Abi Talib, the legitimate, legitimate, legitimate leader. And he is a Baghi based also on the narration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Wailu Ammar, Wotu Ammar, Taqtuluhu al Fiatul Baghiya. He would be killed by the uh, transgressing party or group. So he is Baghi even uh, based on the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He went against the legitimate leader. He came to Iraq. He killed maybe thousands of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, yet he was not called Khariji. And nevertheless, a group of people who decided 
that uh, when Ali accepted Tahkim, this is confusing uh, uh, matter. It concerns the blood of Muslim. We should just stay away. We don't really, after the acceptance of Tahkim, who is the ruler, legitimate Muslim ruler at this point, they just isolated themselves. They were in their camp. They were slaughtered in their own camp. Those were called al-khawarij. And we should distinguish in Arabic between two terms, kharaga'an and kharaga'ala. To to go out uh, from, okay, which what al-khawarij did, they just isolated themselves. Kharaga'an means just to leave and to isolate yourself. And kharaga'ala, which means to go and fight, to go out against. So there is a clear difference between to go out from or to leave literally and to go out against. Which one should be given the name of the Khawarij? Those who just isolated themselves or those who fought against the legitimate, legitimate leader? I leave this open question to our viewers. <laughs> And uh, Sheikh, you know, not to move too sideways, Roxana and I, we always talk about this uh, okay. and we could probably spend a whole separate podcast going over uh, what happened in this period and who the label should apply to more justly, um, because it's a very interesting conversation. And it's something that changed my mind when I read the Kawadrich pamphlets. It's a, it might be a longer series in Arabic, but in English, they have about three or four volumes that kind of go through how the term has been misapplied to, uh, certain groups and use uh, heresiographical literature from non bodies to kind of substantiate their points. So, um, but being, let's get back on the focus topic of Hadith, unless there's something can, else. Can just, I highlight one point here. The Ibadis who come, who, those who came to be known as Ibadis, I mean, they wouldn't have had a problem with the term, term Khawar uh, per se, if it doesn't if it is not associated with negative connotations. Mm. Just as they accepted the word Ibadism or Ibadis uh, three centuries later, uh, they could have accepted the word Khawarij if it is not associated with the extreme Kharigites and their theology and their um, misconduct and so on and so forth. So it is not about terms, it is about what is behind that term, um, as I mentioned, the, or, the origin of the word khurug, if we go to the Quran, is a praiseworthy. In fact, those uh, who uh, did khuruj were the faithful Muslims in the Quran, and those who sit down and didn't join Muslims, they, they were the hi hypocrites, according to the verse in Surah at tawbah in the Holy Quran. So it is not about the term. It is about what is behind that term. Excellent. Interesting. Um, but yeah, moving on to the function of Hadith within the Ibadi tradition, because I think that's also something that is underrepresented or underappreciated is uh, what role does Hadith play within the Ibadi school in relation to Fiqh and Akita? Does it differ from the approaches adopted by other schools in Islam? Well, this is an interesting question. I think Ibadis, just like the majority of Muslims, believe that hadith, being the container of the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the primary source of Islam. And we get to the sunnah through the hadith. So this is the way to reach the sunnah as the secondary, a secondary or the second primary source of Islam. So Ibadis pay attention to Hadith, uh, hence the Musnad of Imam Rabi' ibn Hadith, hence Diwan al-Imam, Gabr bin Zayd, which was wrote, which was written in the first century of al Hijra, the Muslim, the Musnad in the second century of al Hijra. Over the course of Ibadi history, they would quote Hadith as, the, as a primary source of Islamic legislation for both fiqh and aqidah. However, uh, when it comes to aqidah in particular, things come a bit more sensitive because aqidah, uh, the word aqidah in Arabic from the word aqad, 
to tie the knot, which means, uh, which denotes um, a firm belief. So in Aqidah, we have major issues of Aqidah, foundations of Islam, pillars of faith, and we have minor subsidiary issues of Aqidah that doesn't, that don't require firm belief. For the first part, which is the firm uh, beliefs, we require to establish a firm belief, unshakable belief, we require what is called mutawatir hadith and not ahad. So here we have to distinguish between two types of hadith, ahad, which was narrated by single narrators, or there are single narrators uh, in the chain of transmission, or ahad or mutawatir hadith, which is narrated by many narrators at each stage of narration. For the Aqidah, Ibadis, just like the majority of Muslims, believe that uh, for the firm Aqidah to be established, you need to have a mutawatir hadith. Because the Ahad hadith doesn't provide uh, or doesn't give firm knowledge, established knowledge. Because the hadith itself is not well established. I mean, the ahadi hadith that was reported to us by single narrators, in itself, it knows it not well established and or we are not a hundred percent sure about its authenticity. We may think it is correct. That's why we apply it in fiqh. But when it comes to firm established aqidah, we need also firm established source and that cannot be in other than the mutawatir hadith, not a had a hadith. And as I said, this is the majority view of Muslims, not only peculiar to Ibadis. However, the Salafi movement nowadays tries to say, well, we should accept the ahad hadith in terms of al to establish a firm belief and they portray that as it is the majority viewpoint, which mm. is not the case, as we mentioned earlier, uh, from all schools of law, except the Hanbali school of law, uh, the Ibadi, Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hadawi schools of law, they all believe that the firm aqidah has to establish on firm hadith, which makes sense, logical sense. You cannot... Uh, build a firm building, well-established thing on weak foundations. That's why you cannot establish strong aqidah if the narration is not well-established. It could be just if we can accept it today and reject it tomorrow. Right. And that goes against the established firm of belief. As for the categories of hadith, sahih, authentic, uh, hasan, good, Daif, uh, weak, uh, Ibadis follow this classification. Also, Ibadis don't confine themselves to the verbal hadith, uh, Sunnah al qawliya They accept also the practical Sunnah. They accept even also the approval Sunnah. And we find examples to this uh, in the also Musnad al-Imam Rabia, practical hadith as evidence. Also, um, approval hadith also as evidence, even in Muslim, Imam al-Rabi' ibn Habib. In fact, also Ibadis believe that Sunnah is, can be an independent source of legislation for rules, regulations that are not uh, found in the Quran. So it is not just an interpretive source, but it is also an independent source of legislation for many things that are not found in the Quran. It explains words, uh, words that might be seen as ambiguous words in the Quran. Many of them were explained in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Thank you for that. And um, moving on to, because uh, uh, you've mentioned it quite a few times throughout our interview, uh, the Musnid al-Rabi, 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about that collection and uh, how does it function within the school and uh, and which and how, what do they consider its or how do they view its authenticity authenticity and its importance? Yes, Muslim Imam al Rabia is a collection of hadith that was written in the second century of the Hijrah by Imam al Rabia ibn Habib. Who died uh, between one around 176 of the Hijra, some scholars between 175 to 180, but most estimation is to be around 176 of the Hijra. Sorry for not quoting Gregorian dating system because this is how I was classically trained. That's no, okay, people but, can figure it out just yes, like I've had yes. to. <laughs> yes, yes. So I think that is towards the end of the eighth. Eighth centuries, somewhere there in the end of the eighth century. So, yeah, Muslim Imam Rabia is one of the earliest collections of hadith. And that's why it contains what is called Al Isnad Al Ali, the elevated Isnad. Isnad Al Ali means it's in this term, Isnad Al Ali, elevated Isnad, is uh, used for the shorter uh, chains of transmitters. So that is called usually the golden chain of transmitters, which consists usually of three narrators. We find them in most part of Imam Malik. Most hadith of the Imam al Rabi' of the Musnad are considered as having the golden chain of narrators because they consist of three narrators, usually Abu Ubaidah Gaber and the companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay, peace, peace be upon him. And I just have a question right there because me and Roxana actually had a conversation about this not that long ago. So the concept of a golden chain, it's more so about the proximity to the prophet being three narr narrators and not the narrators themselves. Because I was under the impression that it had to be specific narrators. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yes, it is not it, about uh, the quantity. It is also about the quality. Okay. Narrators. For example, uh, yeah, what distinguishes the narrators of uh, Rabia, uh, Abu Ubaida and Gadr, including Al Rabia, then the companion who are not usually questionable here, uh, is that uh, they are all uh, jurists. They are not just collectors of hadith or narrators. They are famously known as narrators. They are famously known as jurists. Mm. And they, each one, not only did he meet the other, but he studied for a long time under the other. So these three or four characteristics make the chain of narration stronger and stronger. It is not just someone who narrates from someone who met him for a few times. Each principal student narrates this narrator from his, uh, from his uh, sheikh or from his mentor who met him and studied under him for a long period of time. It, was just, uh, it wasn't just a passing relationship between the two. And each one, besides being famous narrator, is jurist, so he knows well what he narrates. Mm. They have so many juristic opinions in the uh, juristic compendiums like what we see in Mudawanat Abi Ghanim al Farasani, Fatawa, Imam Gaber, Ibn Zayd, Athar, Rabia, and so on and so forth. So they combine between the shortness and the proximity to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and between, being, between them being narrators and um, famous narrators and well established jurists and leaders of their schools at their time because both all Jabir, Abu Ubaidah and Rabi all are the leaders of the school at their time which lends uh, the chain of narration uh, more importance um I mean thank you so much for that breakdown and this is this is actually the exact topic that we want to get into right now which is exploring the main transmitters that the Abadis rely on uh, in their school um, and looking at a profile of each of them 
and how they've been questioned by non ibadi scholars, etc. So firstly, we want to start with the earliest transmitter, who is uh, Jabrim Zaid. Mm. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask, first of all, what was his role in relation to the foundation of Ibadism? Because he's very much seen as the spiritual father of the Ibadi school. And I wanted to know what exactly he did to earn that that title, essentially. Yeah, I referred earlier, I need to clarify a few things. I referred earlier, the term Ibadis, they, it was called, I mean, it was chosen for them by their opponents. Mm -hmm. So they didn't choose this. They only chose the name of Islam and Muslim and the group of Muslims. So when we talk about the foundation of Ibadis school of, of law or thought, we are not referring to something that was invented later on ibadis or the proto ibadi community didn't mean to invent a school they only meant to just follow the pure way of islam uh, however they were associated with the abdullah ibn ibad a term they didn't accept for the first three centuries and the proof for that we don't find the word ibadi in any other source uh, before the end of the third century of al Hijra, that is in the writing of uh, a Libyan scholar by the name of Amrus ibn Fath al Nafusi in his book Al Dainun al Safi, who passed away around 280 of al Hijra. This is the first reference to the word Ibadi in, in an Ibadi school or in an Ibadi literature or book. Before that, Ibadis seem to be happy with the term Muslims and the people of Islam because they didn't want to invent a school other than that religion which was delivered by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, and regarding Jabir bin Zayd, so as I said earlier, he didn't mean to invent a school. All that he did is delivering the message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But it, he was seen as the main teacher of the uh, proto ibadi community, or as you put it right, the spiritual leader of the proto ibadi community at that time. What he did is he delivered the message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He interpreted the verses of the Quran based, of his, based on his understanding. And he was well versed in these issues based on the witness and the testimony of the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Ibn Abbas himself was reported to have said, عجب الله للعراق كيف يحتاجون إلينا وفيهم جابر بن زيد uh, how surprised is the affairs how surprising is the affairs of the people of العراق how come they resort to us while they have جابر بن زيد then he said لو قصدوا نحوه لو, لو قصدوا نحوه لوسعهم علما عما في كتاب الله if they resort to جابر بن زيد he would have told them about his encompassing knowledge of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was said by Abdullah ibn Abbas and also similar testimony was reported from Gabir ibn Abdullah ibn Haram, another companion of the Prophet. Ibn Umar who was another teacher of Gabir ibn Zayd was reported as saying to Gabir, Ya Gabir, innaka min fuqahai al-Basra, O Gabir, you are among the Jews of Basra. وَإِنَّكَ سَتُسْتَفْتَى And you will be questioned. فَلَا تُفْتِيَنَّ إِلَّا بِقُرْآنِ النَّاطِقِنَ أَوْ سُنَّةِ النُّمَاضِيَةِ Don't uh, give fatwa except with uh, explicit verse in the Qur'an or practice sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the similar witnesses came from other scholars uh, from outside the Ibadi school of law, if we want to consult non Ibadi school of law, for example, uh, Ibn Ma'in uh, said about uh, Gabir ibn Zayd, Basriyun Thiqa, 
similar witness said by Abu Zura, he said Basriyun as Diyun Thika, which means he is trustworthy from Al Basra and from Azd, according to the addition of Abu Zura. Later on, Ibn Hagar, who is regarded as Imam al Garh wa Ta'deel, uh, sorry, Amir al Mu'mineen fil Hadith, he says, the commander of believers in Hadith, he said, Thiqatun Faqih, jurist, jurist, and also Thiqa. All of these are witness to the reliability, Hadith reliability of Imam Gabir bin Zayd. In fact, um, his narrations, the narration of Gabir bin Zayd, Gabir bin Zayd, being a narrator is found in all six books of Sunnah, including Bukhari, Muslim, Nasai, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and beyond the six books of Sunnah, like Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, Musnad Ahmed bin Hanbal, and other collections of hadith. And scholars of hadith say, if a narrator was used to convey a correct narration, that means this is uh, an authentication from the compiler of that collection of the hadith. So the, I, I think the hadith reliability of Gabir bin Zayd is not questionable by Ibadis and non-Ibadis alike. It is an issue of consensus and agreement between Ibadis and many non-Ibadi sources that Gabir bin Zayd was a spiritual teacher or a spiritual leader of the school uh, during its formative period. Okay, so so we can we can be fairly certain that non ibadi scholars of Rajal also agree with Ibadi scholars in terms of in terms of um, Jabir uh, bin Zayd's uh, reliability. Uh, in terms of um, the works transmitted from him in Ibadi literature. Um, what what do we have extant from him? Have there any have any been lost? Um, and uh, yeah, what, what do we basically have from him within Ibadi sources? Yeah, uh, obviously the Musnad, which is a collection of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, was reported through Gabir bin Zayd by Abu Ubaidah, then by Arabi Ibn Habib. Uh, Fatawa Gabir bin Zayd, which are, which are religious answers of Gabir bin Zayd, they were recently collected encyclopedia of fiqh of Gabir bin Zayd, which was also recently collected. All of these, we believe, might have been uh, sourced from a book called Iwan in Gabir bin Zayd, uh, a ten-volume book. Um, that Gabir bin Zayd wrote himself, which is lost. It is believed that the one Imam Gabir bin Zayd, which he recorded uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his juristic opinions, was lost. It was believed it was uh, in uh, in uh, in Al Maghrib, but uh, it was destroyed also in Maktabat Baghdad, Baghdad Library which was destroyed by a Tatar. It was believed some copies were there. And um, it is a huge, uh, I mean, work. It, it consists of eight volumes, ten volumes, sorry, sorry. And it was a camel load, as uh, people, uh, historians describe it. Because this makes sense, I mean, uh, the huge size of these books. If we know that at that time, there, the paper wasn't invented, or at least it didn't reach the Muslim world at that time. Uh, Jonathan Brown argues that paper reached the Muslim world towards the end of the second century, uh, which means also Rabi ibn Habib must have written his Muslim in uh, in something else other than paper because it was it hasn't reached at that time, which makes the reproduction of this compilation is very difficult, which limited the the process 
of copying them, reproducing them, spreading them at that time. So they must have written these in uh, much more expensive uh, writing material like papyrus or parchments. Uh, in fact, it was said during that time, if you want to have a, one copy of the Holy Quran, you need to slaughter hundreds of sheep in order to get one copy of the Holy Quran. It's not only slaughtering this amount of sheep, it's obtaining them and long process because parchment was expensive. It is not when you want to write a book or to, to copy a book, it is not just like grabbing a book note from a bookshop and you just copy. It was a huge project. And we know that neither Abrabi nor uh, Gaber ibn Zayd had the sponsor that had the, the state uh, back, or they were not sponsored by the state. I mean, so they didn't have the resources. Unlike, for example, Muwatta uh, al-Imam uh, Malik, which was sponsored, which was a request to be written by the state, by the Abbasid caliphs, and so hence it spread contrary to what happened to Rabi' ibn Habib and his Musnad, who was being chased by the authorities, the first the Umayyad authorities, and then the Abbasid authorities. In fact, there are narrations that state that Rabi' himself shut himself away mm. from public life so that uh, he is not known by public and by extension by the authorities. And hence, um, the non, I mean, non-spread of Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi' ibn Habib. And this is one reason that al-Rabi' ibn Habib might not have been well known, just like Imam Malik or any of his contemporaries, because you cannot compare between two figures. One is sponsored by the state, mm -hmm. and one is being chased by this state. Right. Um, what? What? Just to pinpoint, what role did Jabim Zaid play um, in terms of the sort of systemization uh, and establishment of Ibadi Fit? So, in terms of it being a, a systemized school. What role did he play in that? And I, will... I mean, uh, the Ibabi community started taking shape during the time of Jabir ibn Zayd. Uh, but it, I mean, it reached its peak during his student, uh, Abu Ubaidah, Muslim ibn Abi Karima, at Tamimi. Jabir ibn Zayd was the reference scholar of his time, but he would always hide himself from the Umayyad authorities. In fact, when he was caught, he was exiled uh, back to Oman. So um, the role of Gaber ibn Zayd is the role of conveyor of the, of the message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the role of interpreter to the school followers of the Quran, the Quranic verses. However, I believe the Ibabi identity took more shape during his student, Abu Ubaidah, Muslim ibn Abi Karima. At Tamimi, the school was more systemized. The, he formed what I would call semi-government and what we call later semi-secret government and what we call later as a Kitman stage in Ibabi school. There are four stages, Abuhur, like manifestation, Adifa, the defense, a shira to sell yourself for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the least one is al-kitman, which was practiced by Abu Ubaidah, the secrecy. Al-kitman literally means secrecy. During the state or the time of Abu Ubaidah, he formed what is called the secret maganis. Some of them were secret. Uh, so the first one is the public. Meglis for anyone at the beginning. Then he resorted to other Meglis, uh, which is the Mashayikh Meglis. Meglis literally means like a session or a place of meeting followers. So uh, 
they started with the public Maglis, but with uh, being chased by the Umayyad, that was limited. Then he started with two other secret Maglis, the Mashaikh Maglis, for the main leaders of the Ibadi community, and uh, um, the students of knowledge Maglis, which was meant for the student of knowledge and these maglis took place in interestingly in basements or undergrounds i mean until now we give this example that sirdab abu ubaidah the basement of abu ubaidah for any like secret uh, event or event that is not meant to be public we call it sirdab abu ubaidah literally sirdab means uh, the basement so, I mean, the books of history tell us about uh, how Abu Ubaidah would teach his uh, students underground, and when there is a guy on the first ground, on the on the uh, on the on the first floor or uh, uh, overground, when he hears that the authorities, when he senses that the authorities is around, he would check a metallic chain to alert. Uh, Abu Ubaidah that someone is coming from the assassin. So they keep quiet. And uh, as a camouflage, Abu Ubaidah would um, pretend to teach his students Al Qifaq, which is a, a craftsmanship uh, to, to make traditional baskets, usually from the leaves of palm trees. Hence his other name as Al Qafaq the one who is skilled with making these traditional baskets. So I, I, do, I do have a question about that because me and Roxana were discussing this aspect of Abu Ubaidah's uh, career. Was he, a, did he really know how to uh, weave baskets? Because um, I found something saying that he had humble origins weaving basket and then weaving baskets and then Roxana corrected me and said, no, he used that as a proxy or a, a, a cover when the government was coming and he was teaching. I think he knew how to do basket, uh, despite the fact that he was a blind man. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do have many blind people in the Middle East who just who are just skillful in these things. Um, Abu Ubaidah, uh, he was not. He was called Al Qaffa. Al Qaffa is exaggerated form of description which means the one who is highly skilled mm. in doing al-qifaf. Al-qifaf is the ruler form of al-qif, which means the traditional basket. He wouldn't, uh, he would have, he would have been called, I mean, at that time as al-qifaf. So which means he mastered the skills. He may sell them. He may have sold this qifaf, but uh, it is, I mean, it's always there next to him when the authorities were, were there. And yeah, so these are some of the secret megalis. And uh, following the question of systemization, we see that not only he taught his, uh, his uh, students underground, he sent them abroad. That's why we have the bearers of knowledge, Hamlet al-Ilm to the east and to the west. Mm -hmm. To the east, um, we know Rabi ibn Habib to Oman, and uh, beside Musa ibn Abi Gabal, Azkawi, Bashir ibn al and Nizwani, Muhammad ibn al Ma'alla, Al Fishhi. And to the west, also, he has a number of students that he sent to the west, including Abu al Khattab, Abd al A'la ibn al Samh al Ma'afri, Abd al Rahman ibn Rustum as well as Abu Dawood Al-Qibli and Nifzawi, Asim Sidrati, a number of them went to the West. And his students established three imamates during his time. Mm. In Al-Yemen, Abu uh, Talib Al-Haq, Abdullah ibn Yahya Al-Kindi from 129 to 130. In Oman, Al-Gulind ibn Mas'ud from 132 to 134, I believe. In uh, North Africa, Abu Al-Khattab from 140 to 144. Mm -hmm. These three imamates, uh, I mean, took place during his time and under his guidance. That's why the school took shape 
clear shape during the time of Abu Ubaidah more than it did during the time of Gabir ibn Zaydi. And I found it surprising that they would refer, all of these different imamates um, would refer their questions back to Abu Ubaidah, back to Basra. I found that to be very interesting, being that they had three separate organizations right. going on. And during that, that was the custom, even during the time of Abu Ubaidah, when he took over after his mentor, Gabir ibn Zaid, people, the imam, the Rustumid imams, like Abdul Wahab bin Abdul Rahman bin Rustum, would refer back to, to Rabi ibn Habib and his opponents, interestingly enough, Abdul Wahab opponents would agree with Abdul Wahab to resort to Rabi ibn Habib in our disputable issues. And hence, the authorship of Al Risal al Hujjah, the book that was uh, co authored by Al Rabi ibn Habib and his colleagues in Mecca al Mukarrama. And luckily, we have now Al Risala al Hujjah, which was found recently and edited and published, which is another eyewitness to the legacy of the Imam al rabi ibn Habib and another rebuttal to those who doubt his historicity. Okay, wow. Very, very interesting. I mean, that what you just explained about the secrecy that was involved um, in, the, in the meetings that Abu Ubaidah ran um, gives a really good indication as to why he was so little known uh, by non ibadi scholars, for example, compared to Jabrim Zaid, um, who uh, was able to operate a little bit more openly um uh so that that explains his sort of lack of presence in non ibadi books but uh, and that's what often causes the controversy around him um but one question i had is that there's some scholarship that has undermined the ibadi claim that abu Ubaida was jabrim zaid's most important student for example uh wilkinson claims that there was a it was a layer of transmitters between Jabrim Zaid and Abu Ubaida, and that actually it was uh, Dumam in Al Sayyib who was uh, Jabrim Zaid's senior student. Um, so, how do Ibadis prove direct transmission between Jabrim Zaid and Abu Ubaida, and how do they also address the contention that Abu Ubaida was too young? to be Jabrim Zaid's principal transmitter. He might have met him, but he wasn't his most important student, that in fact there was a layer of students between him and Jabrim Zaid. Yeah, thank you for this interesting and provocative question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I would like to make a short introduction before answering the next question. And this uh, short introduction, which I hope to be brief, uh, is applicable to these questions and many questions when it comes to investigating figures of Ibadi school and literature within the Ibadi school. Which, I mean, scholarship should not be confined to a particular group of people. Scholar scholarship should be should not be exclusive to a particular group of people. Scholarship from any school of law should complement one, one another. Varied sources from different Islamic schools of law should uh, be considered when it comes to investigating issues, especially if we are investigating a particular book or a particular person, we need to consult, uh, to consult the uh, scholarship or the literature associated with that book or that particular person. Hence, when we are discussing or investigating or examining Rabi ibn Habib or Abu Ubaidah or Gabir, we need to take the Ibadah literature into consideration because there is in the Ibadah literature what, what was not there in mainstream literature, if I can call it, because these people were away from public life. So we can get the real information from those who surrounded these people, from their students and the students of their students. Hence, the Ibadi literature should not be omitted for a real academic 
or a real a transmitter. I mean, you refer to Wilkinson's claim that uh, there is a layer between Gaber bin Zayd and Abu Ubaidah. In fact, when we consult a body literature, when we take a body literature into consideration, we find that in Athar al-Imam al rabi direct quotation from Abu Ubaidah that he asked Gaber bin Zayd. He asked literally Gaber bin Zayd's number of questions. And when we consult Mudawan ibn Abi Ghanim, the famous compendium of Abu Ghanim, we find narration that Abu Ubaidah did ask and question uh, uh, Gaber ibn Zayd. In fact, the whole idea of the Mudawana or the primary idea of the Mudawana is to report the statements of Abu Ubaidah through his main uh, students. The Musnad of al Rabia, the whole Musnad of al Rabia, almost most narrations of the Musnad were reported from Abu Ubaidah, from Gaber bin Zayd. In fact, uh, some later biographers mentioned that Abu Ubaidah did meet some companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and this is visible. Uh, in a couple of narrations in Muslim where Abu Ubaidah explicitly mentioned that I heard this from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The idea of Abu Ubaidah meeting Gaber bin Zayd, asking, interacting with the Gaber bin Zayd was further confirmed by later, by later biographers like Ibn Salam, who lived in the 3rd century, Ibn Mahbub, who was a stepson of al rabi ibn Habib, also by Dargini, who, who literally mentioned that Abu Ubaidah was the senior of Gaber's students. Mm. So uh, these are among the narrations. As for among the uh, literature that confirm the meeting or ittisal between Abu Ubaidah and Gaber ibn Zayd. As for the question that Abu Ubaid was too young to learn from Gaber bin Zayd, I find this question weird a bit. If we know that Abu Ubaid uh, was born between 45 and 50 of the Hijra, while Gaber bin Zayd passed away uh, around 93 of the Hijra. Uh, so this makes Abu Ubaid at least 43 years old when Gaber ibn Zayd passed away. So, which makes Abu Ubaidah a perfect candidate to succeed Gaber ibn Zayd, which makes Abu Ubaidah a perfect principal or senior student of Gaber ibn Zayd. So, the idea of Abu Ubaidah be, being too young to meet Gaber ibn Zayd, I don't think it is a strong argument. I, and do we have in Ibadi literature, obviously, like you, you made a very good point about how researchers, if they're going to be intellectually honest, need to take into consideration a wide range of literature instead of uh, reducing themselves to a particular sex source. Um, so within Ibadi works, do we have confirmation from Jabrim Zaid saying that Abu Ubaidah is his most important student? Um, I don't recall now that an explicit statement made by Gaber bin Zayd, this is my explicit student, or this should succeed me. I don't recall that, mm -hmm. which we don't have to have in order to confirm the meeting between the two. However, similar statements are there from Abu Ubaidah to his student, al Rabi bin Habib. When Abu Ubaidah said about al Rabi ibn Habib, uh, Imamuna, when he was asked about al Rabi ibn Habib, Imamuna wa thaqatuna wa faqihuna, our leader, our trustworthy students, wa uh, faqihuna, our jurist. And another indication that Abu Ubaidah would go to Al Hajj, would make use of the season of Hajj or pilgrimage uh, every year. But he, when he was too young, uh, too sorry, old to go to Al Hajj, he delegated Al Rabi ibn Habib to be uh, his deputy or his representative 
in al hajj which made strong indication that al-rabia is the senior student of abu ubaida so we do have this from al-rabia and abu ubaida hmm. um okay so so i think we've we've looked at abu ubaida in quite some depth we've looked at his role in terms of the the organization of the Abadi school and his legacy in terms of that and also why the controversy around him um one thing that's very interesting is that although abu Beda is um is 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 present in in non abadi works he's not as present as ajabrim say but he's there um one the the figure of arabi in habib is more controversial so because unlike the other two transmitters um arabi's historical existence has been questioned by some non ibadi scholars so can you talk to me a little bit about which scholars have raised doubts about the historical existence of arabi are they are they contemporary scholars or are they earlier classical scholars and what mistakes do you feel they made in their research that led them to the conclusion that that questioned his historical existence uh, thank you for this question. This is another interesting one. Um, the historicity of Al Imam al Rabia ibn Habib. Uh, with the reference to which scholars who denied his historical presence, I came to know that uh, two scholars, uh, based on my research, recently made this claim that al Rabia is a fictionous person. He never existed on this earth. Uh, this this statement was made by a Salik, a contemporary researcher called a Salik. He said never existed on this earth. Another um, contemporary academic who made a similar statement is called Al Humaid. He said uh, on one occasion that Rabi was not born by the wombs of women. This is a correct translation sorry for my translation i mean yeah um uh, and i think they were influenced by the late scholar of hadith al-albani the late salafi scholar of hadith al-albani and they all based their argument i think al-albani made the statement that um uh, al Rabi' is not known before the 1000 uh, of Al Hijra, mm -hmm. neither in our sources, non Ibadi sources, nor in their sources, meaning the Ibadis. So, this answers part of your question what error or what basis they base their claim on. They claimed that Al Rabi' ibn Habib. Uh, was never known before 1000. So he was invented after 1000 of Al Hijra. And the mistake, I believe, behind that is the lack of thorough research. One thing, uh, because Al Rabi' mentioned uh, before the 1000 of Al Hijra. And the other mistake, I believe, is that they didn't consult Ibadi, uh, I mean, literature. They thought scholarship is exclusive to their school, whatever school they belong to. Uh, they exercise monopoly over literature. Literature is the literature, and the other literature, maybe they didn't consult it or they see it worthless. So um, these are the mistakes, and these are contemporary scholars. And um, as students study, uh, students of studying in academia, as researchers, as academics teaching in universities, they should have resorted to the primary sources of the school. They should have consulted, for example, Mudawanat Abi Ghanim, in which there are countless narrations of Abu Ghanim himself asking Abu Ubaidah. They should have consulted, for example, al rasal al hujjah which I referred to earlier as co-authored by al rabi and his um, and his colleagues. 
they should have consulted, for example, Athar Rabi', which was collected by Abu Sufra, Abdul Malik ibn Sufra, in the first third of the third century. They should have consulted Seer Abi Sufyan, who is stepson of uh, Al Rabi' ibn Habib, who wrote Seer and referred to his interaction, his first hand interaction with Al Rabi' ibn Habib. They should have consulted Ibn Salam who lived a century after Rabia ibn Salam in his very valuable book called Bid al-Islam wa Shara'i al-Din. He is um, a North African scholar and his book is not, not only is considered the first historical reference or one of the historical reference to, uh, to Ibabism in the third century, but it is considered one of the earliest, if it is not the earliest historical uh, reference for the Islamic history in North Africa, with mm -hmm. Islam and Sharia al-Din. Another scholar in the third century, Ibn Ga'far, he referred to Arabia and his narration in the third century. And many scholars uh, in the fourth century, for example, Abu Zakaria, Yahya, in his book, Seer Al-Imma Wa Akhbaruhum, he lived in the fourth century. Both uh, Ibn, Ab, uh, Ibn Baraka and Abu Sa'id al-Qudami, who they who uh, they were rivals. Uh, one, the leader, the leader of the Rustaq school, and the other of the Nizwan school, both mentioned Al Rabi and quoted his narrations. And in Al Yemen as well, Hadramaut, a number of Ibadi scholars mentioned Al Rabi' in their compilation, like uh, Abu Ishaq al Hadrami in Mukhtasar al Khisal in the 5th century. The 6th century, Ibn Khalfun, and uh, as well, who mentioned Al Rabi' ibn Habib and the exact chain of transmission. Uh, also, uh, who mentioned Al Rabi' uh, uh, so the author of Bayan Shara, the 73 volume book, Bayan Shara, by Al Kindi, he mentioned uh, Arabia. So, if we consult, these are before the sixth century, before Abu Yaqub al Wariglan, let alone before the 1000 year. Uh, after that, we have Dargini, we have Al Baradi, we have, uh, we have uh, Shamakhi who are famous biographers who dedicated whole biography to the life and intellectual legacy of al Rabi' ibn Habib. So the mistake they made, they didn't consult Ibadah literature. They, they rushed to make this conclusion. I'm not sure if they re retracted what they said. I, I mean, they should have. Hope so. Um, so... Um, so prior to Al Albani, was he the earliest scholar to question um, Arabi's historical existence, or was there anybody earlier than him? I didn't, to be honest, I didn't make a thorough research mm -hmm. in the in on this particular topic. But Al Rabi was mentioned by the senior scholars of Hadith, so I doubt. Um, so th yeah, so that's what I wanted to ask you. So is he is he referred to in non Ibadi works of Rajah? Yes, besides the Ibadi works, which I said has to be taken seriously, many non Ibadi works made reference to Arabi. In fact, many, I mean, uh, primary scholars of Al Garh wa Ta'deen, that is the science of approving, of disapproving the narrators of Hadith, refer to Arabi ibn Habib. For example, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Uh, the leader or the founder of the Hanbali School of Law referred to Al Rabi' in his book, Al Ilal wa Ma'rifat al Rijal. He said, Ma Arabihi Ba'san. And this statement, if it is said by Ahmed bin Hanbal or Ibn Ma'in, it means he is authentic yeah. uh, or trustworthy. Uh, Ibn Ma'in, the leader of Al Garh wa Al Ta'deen, said about him, Thiqa. Ibn Shaheen said about him, Thiqa. Uh, Al-Bukhari mentioned him in his Al-Tariq uh, Al-Kabir and he didn't criticize him. Many scholars said if Al-Bukhari didn't criticize a narrator that he mentioned that is a sign of authentication. 
uh, at Dara Qutni, he said his hadith should not be omitted. Sorry. So, so there are there are like quite a few references to him in the yes. Ibadi works. Yes. Um, and in terms of um Ibadi works, you already mentioned that that you gave a, a wonderfully long list, an extensive list of of works that have um you know contemporarily recorded details about his life. Um, uh, did he did Arabi besides the Musnad? Did he leave behind written works that are still extant in the Ibadi school? Yeah, besides the Musnad, I refer to Al Risan al Hujja, which was mm -hmm. co authored by Al Rabi and his colleagues. We do have it and edited and published. And there is an online version of it, electronic version. One can find it online. And beside that, we have another book which was recently edited and published uh, which were questions mostly posed by Abu Ghanim al-Khurasani beside al-Mudawwana they were collected under the title Futiya al-Rabiya we do have Kitab al-Aqida which was later made as for uh, appendix to Musnad al-Imam al-Rabiya this is an interesting book it discusses in the second century of the Hijra theological issues as they develop in the in the Islamic history. So one of the earliest sources to look at the Ibadi view points on some contentious theological issues. Athar Rabi ibn Habib, which I referred earlier, which was collected by Abu Sufra ibn Malik ibn Sufra, who may have met al Rabi. We are not sure about that, but he collected it in the third century of Al Hijra. It is basically the narrations of Al Rabi from his other Shaykh. From his other Shaykh. It is the collection of Al Rabi from his other Shaykh. I mean, not from Al Rabi, rather from Buman bin Sa'id. Mm -hmm. So the Musnad is the collection of Al Rabi from Gabir through Abu Ubaidah. While Athar Rabi is the collection of Rabi from Gabir through Bumam ibn as -Sa'id. So it seems Rabi also met and studied under uh, Bumam ibn Sa'id, who was another student of Rabi ibn Habib, uh, yeah, who was I another student of Gabir. I, I remember reading that, that Abu Rabi identified three main mentors yeah. in terms of fiqh. So Abu Ubaidah, Dumam, and Abu Nuf. Abu Nuh Salih al yeah. exactly. Um, so let's let's focus <coughs> a little bit more on the most important work uh, attributed to Arabi and obviously the Badi school's main hadith collection, which is his Musnad, which comprises about 1,005 narrations. Um, so some scholars have suggested uh, that the Musnad is a very late work, dating from the 6th century. Um, so I don't know if these are the same scholars who questioned Arabi's historical existence or these are different scholars. Um, so what evidence is available to us in Ibadi and non-Ibadi sources that establishes the early existence of the Muslim? Yes, uh, regarding the scholars, if you deny the historical existence of Arabi, then you have to ascribe this work to someone who lives much later than the supposed uh, date of Arabia. Mm -hmm. So these scholars had to find out another person to claim this uh, compendium was written by or invented by. Mm -hmm. So they said because Arabia doesn't exist based on their conclusion, they said, okay, this work was invented by Abu Yaqub al-Wariglan, the sixth century theologian Abu Yaqub al-Wariglani. And they based their conclusion on another fallacy that this book never existed before Abu Yaqub al-Wariglani. And why they reached to this conclusion it is just like why they reached the first conclusion. They didn't consult the Ibadi literature. They ignored the Ibadi literature. They omitted the Ibadi literature. They maybe exercised 
monopoly and exclusivity over the literature and uh, they thought our literature is the literature that should be taken into consideration. However, the we have so, so many evidence that the Musnad did exist before uh, Abu Yaqub al before the 6th century, from the many books that quoted Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi' either here in Oman or in North Africa or Yemen, where the Ibadi school flourished uh, over during these centuries. Um, I refer to Ibn Ja'far, uh, Abu Gabr, Muhammad Ibn Ja'far, who lived a century after Rabi', who was a student of the students of Rabi' Ibn Habib. He quoted um, a number of uh, narrations that are found in Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi' Ibn Habib. In my research, I focused on the Afrad narrations that are found nowhere except in Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi' and I excluded the narrations that are that we have in common in Musnad al-Rabi' and other collections of hadith to make sure that these guys are literally quoting the Musnad al-Rabi' ibn Habib. For example, Ibn Ga'far, who died in the eighth decade of the third century, uh, referred to a narration in the Musnad that is not found anywhere except in the Musnad. So we consider it among the Farad, the Musnad. Uh, that says which means that um, let the water reach between your fingers before uh, it is this is done by fire or something like this in the hereafter this is found nowhere except in Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi' um, other uh, scholars Quoted Musnad, quoted Afrad narrations from the Musnad Abu Sa'id al Kudami. For example, in his book, the commentary on Kitab al Ashraf al Ibn al Mundar al Nisaburi, so one of his valuable works, he made a commentary on a Shafi'i and on a contemporary Shafi'i scholar who wrote Kitab called Al Ashraf. And although Ibn Mundar lived in Nisabur, uh, quite remote uh, area from Oman, and although he was contemporary to Abu Sa'id, yet Abu Sa'id was able to get hold of his book and made a commentary on his book. In his commentary, Abu Sa'id referred, mentioned a narration that is unique to Muslim Imam Rabi'. Uh, found nowhere except in the Musnad al Rabi' ibn Habib that says, Al Wudu'u min al Madi wal Ghuslu min al Mani. And also, uh, his contemporary or his rival, in fact, Ibn Baraka, the rival to Abu Sa'id al Qudami, they lived in the same time. Each one headed a school of his own within the Ibadi school, the Rustaqi and the Nizwani, based on a political split in the school in the third century. So Ibn Baraka in his book, Gam Ibn Baraka, he quoted around 66 narrations of the Afrad. I'm not talking about uh, the narration that is also found in other collections of Hadith, but among the 97 Afrad narrations in the Musnad, Ibn Baraka quoted in his Yama 66 narration, which is a large number uh, of narrations to be quoted by Ibn Baraka, which means that literally Ibn Baraka had the Musnad of Rabi' just next to him, quoting so many narrations that are not found in any other collections of Hadith, so um, which makes it hard to believe that the Muslim didn't exist before the sixth century. That's Later, that's really interesting. yeah, so that's then that that's obviously far before what Abu had yeah. anything to do with 
with reorganizing the Muslim six centuries. Yes, yes. This, uh, I mean, Ibn Barak had passed away approximately in 363, so around two centuries uh, before uh, Al Warglani. Abu Sa'id was passed away shortly before Ibn Barak in 361 of Al-Hijra. So these rival scholars both quoted Afrad narrations from the Muslim of Arabia. Um, among uh, the scholars who quoted the Muslim, let me diversify, let's choose from North Africa, al sorry, not al Warglani, al Ganawni, in his uh, famous book, Al Wada, he quoted Al Muslim. He quoted them with their chain of transmitters, with the commentary of al Rabi. Not only he quoted the narration with their chain of transmitters, but al Rabi made comments. We find them in Musnad. Ibn al Warglani, whose name is Yahya ibn Abi al Khayr al Warglani, lived in the fourth century. He quoted even what al Rabi commented on that the narration regarding the prayer of fear. Another thing, he, I mean, kept the same order that we find now in Musnad. It is there found in, uh, I mean, um, Muslim, in al Ganawni. His book is called al Wada. He quoted two narrations, one after another, with a Rabi' comment, with his chain of transmitters. All that we find it exactly in the Musnad that we have today. So it is hard to believe that. This uh, scholar who lived in the fourth century uh, couldn't doesn't have access to the Muslim or the Muslim doesn't exist. Yes. It is extra right. next to next to him when he caused the two narrations one after uh, the other in the same order that we find in the Muslim with the same chain of transmission with the exact same comment of Rabi. On the yeah. other, yeah. That would be a strange coincidence if he didn't have some text to refer to. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Um, and in terms of in terms of manuscript evidence. Yeah. So, what manuscript evidence do we have available? What is the date of the earliest manuscript we have access to? And why might a very early manuscript of Arabi's transmissions not be extant? Do do you know? Is there, are there reasons as to why? Um, perhaps we, we don't have a very early manuscript and do we have any hopes that it's possible that one will be discovered? Yes, in terms of the earliest manuscript we have of the Musnad, a complete earliest manuscript of the Musnad, we have a manuscript that dates back to the 9th century, the beginning of the 9th century, uh, which was copied exactly in the 8th uh, in the year 815 of al Hijra, So we have this complete, although it is six centuries old, we do have it, uh, the complete one in al Yadr in Wadi Mizab in North Africa, modern day Algeria. And uh, this is the earliest complete manuscript of the Muslim. As to why we don't have earlier manuscripts. I mean, it is common at the end paper and written material, I mean, they are fragile. It's hard to find a manuscript that dates back to a thousand or beyond, because at the end, these are papers, but you can find copies of copies of copies of these manuscripts. At the end, paper or parchment, I mean, they become fragile over the time. And um, another reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, the Ibadi school was not sponsored by, in, I, I mean, at its uh, formative period by states like the Umayyad or the Abbasid, they were seen actually as a threat to their uh, monarchies because of the idea that um, the, the proto ibadi community see that the Khilafa doesn't have to be uh, within a certain tribe or lineage of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, anyone who is qualified 
could be a, a leader for the Muslim community. That's why they were a target by many rising powers like the Umayyad Abbasids uh, in North Africa, the Fatimids. So, for example, uh, Al Maktab Al Ma'suma, which, which was established by Abdul Rahman, Imam Abdul Wahab bin Abdul Rahman bin Rustum, was completely destroyed by. Uh, at the, when uh, the Umay when the Rustamid dynasty falls uh, in or fell uh, in around two hundred and sixty of Al Hijra or sorry two hundred and ninety of Al Hijra, so at the hands of the Fatimids at the hands of the Fatimid and the Maktab of Al Masuma or Al Masuma library. And um, during the time of Abdul Wahab bin Abdul Rahman bin Rustum, Imam al Rabi' sent many books to him. So copies of the Muslim, or at least one copy of the Muslim, might have been in this uh, library. Um, also in Oman, uh, it was attacked by someone who, who uh, uh, Abbas al governor. He was called Ibn Nur, but the Omanis called him Ibn Bur because of his atrocities against the Omanis. Uh, in one occasion, he destroyed libraries in both Nizwa and Rastaq. Both of them are former capitals of Oman. And uh, another library in Izki was also destroyed. Uh, by later invaders and attackers like uh, the Wahhabi Mutlaq al Mutairi. And there was a famous incident in the ancient city of Izki where the books uh, were brought in piles and he set fire to them. So these might be reasons as to whether we don't have uh, much earlier copies of the Muslim of Al Rabia bin Habib. And yeah. I was just going to say, which are reasons uh, to consider without suspicion, given the fact that many other schools have had the same history concerning their works that we no longer have. Rather, uh, libraries have been burnt, uh, manuscripts have fallen out of use, stacked in libraries, forgotten, or uh, have been destroyed just by sitting over time. Um, so, you know, all of what you're saying doesn't sound too strange when you consider all of the written history dating back from this period and, and moving uh, beyond. Because I know that's something that some people try to say, oh, because uh, we only have a certain manuscript of a later date, that must mean that it was only created at that date when that's really not the case because of the examples you mentioned where these works are mentioned uh, in older sources where scholars have had knowledge of them uh, and spoke yeah. about them and quoted them. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of Rabi and what is associated with the Rabi, there are works. We thought they are lost, but we came to know recently. For example, Risal al -Fugia. We found the references by the recent biographers like Dardini and Al Shammaqi to the works of Al Rabi, including Rasal Al Hujja. So we knew that it is there. I mean, we knew that he wrote it. We didn't find it. Recently, it was discovered, Al Rasal Al Hujja. Also, Kitab Al Asma, uh, a book was written by Abu Yaqub Al Bariglani. It, was, it has been believed for a long time that it is lost. And interestingly, the Kitab Lesma, the Book of Names, Abu Yaqub al Wariglani wrote it as a biography for the narrators of al Rabia. Mm. The narrators that al Rabia narrated from including Jabir, Ibn Abbas, and many narrators, because there are many narrators in the Musnad that are not even from the uh, that are not even associated with the Ibab school of law that Abu uh, Abu Yaqub al-Wariglani wrote a biography about them so he wrote a book we call Kitab al-Asma about the narrators uh, that were included in the Musnad of Rabi for a long period of time uh, we thought we have no hope to find this book 
And interestingly, recently, at the beginning, they found a few pages of this, I think one or two pages. So the, that was published and edited and published. Uh, luckily, a few later, a few years later, we found the whole book of Al Asma, uh, the biographies of the narrators of the Musnad al Rabi ibn Hadd. I believe it was found just a few years ago wow. in the very same uh, book collection of Al Yaddar that we find, uh, I mean, the earliest uh, manuscript of the Musnad al Rabi ibn Habib dating back to the ninth century. That, so, that's really interesting. So, so this gives us are, hope. Yeah, I was going to say that perhaps there is hope. Yes. That, that, um, that uh, an earlier manuscript of the Musnad will be discovered at some point. Whether in Oman or outside. I mean, I just came to know a few days ago, mm -hmm. or a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, that there is a manuscript copy of the Musnad here in Britain, in the UK. Wow. So I, I, I sent, um, I mean, I corresponded with the researcher who mentioned this in a YouTube channel, in a YouTube video. So I'm just investigating as to where this manuscript copy of the Musnad is here in the UK. He said just in Britain. He didn't give any details. Okay. So I'm... Um, trying to find out where here in the UK there is a manuscript copy of the Musnad. That would that's, be interesting. That's, that's so interesting. And and it just shows that, the, um, that yeah, that there's a possibility of... of, of if we have them Istanbul. here in the UK, we may have them in Turkey, in Istanbul, for example, where it is believed it, the, the Suleimani Library house, I mean, houses, hundreds of thousands of manuscripts that many of them were taken from Egypt, for example. Yeah, so I believe there's a lot to be uncovered and a lot more manuscripts to be added to our knowledge of Ibadism. I know uh, w coming from your background, probably a lot of this stuff is, uh, you probably know a lot more than what academics have available at their fingertips, um, especially when you consider the work of uh, uh, Caliph um, Amr Anami, uh, the uh, Libyan Ibadi scholar who did his PhD in Cambridge uh, in the 70s, and then Al Salami, how they have uh, introduced so many more manuscripts to the academic study of Ibadism to where that uh, these academics would never have had access to them otherwise. So it seems like a more collaborative effort um, than what you might see with the other schools of Islam. And I know academics in those fields can correct me if I'm wrong, but with the Ibadi school, it seems like a, a traditional effort and an academic effort. And when I say academic from traditional, doesn't mean the traditional study of Ibadism is no less, is any less academic. I just use those to distinguish mm -hmm. the two. Yeah. It seems like there's a real fruitful collaborative effort to try to understand Ibadism as, at its earliest period and how it developed through time, which um, I'm excited to see what type of fruits come out of it. I mean, uh, what I find fascinating about uh, researching on Ibadism, it is always there are so many understudied areas and uh, untapped areas in Ibadi studies. This I find fascinating. And there is always room for researchers to look at niche areas with, within the Ibadi literature that uh, ha that have not been uh, touched by researchers before. Studies in Ibadi, I mean, it's always understudied. The Ibadi literature is always understudied. But there is a growing number of academics in the East and the West who are being exposed to Ibadi literature, who are showing uh, interest in Ibadi literature, this, regardless of their conclusions, regardless of their conclusions, I mean. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing you can't control. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> regardless of their conclusion, regardless of what we have, but we appreciate their efforts. I mean, Shaht, for example, uh, he had some words on Ibadi studies. We we don't necessarily agree with his conclusions. Uh, Wilkinson, as you referred earlier, regarding the layer between the hidden layer between Abu Ubaidah and Rabia Ibn Habib and other contemporary researchers. We appreciate their efforts, 
but we do still have some reservations regarding the end conclusion they came to know. And yes. I think, yeah, I think it's important in all of this academic interest in Ibadism, particularly as an understudied area of Islam, that that also that Ibadi voices are not lost in that, that that it shouldn't just be other other people talking about Ibadis, as, as fascinating as that is, and it's as interesting as it is to have in-depth academic studies from Western scholars into mm. the Ibadi school. Correct, yeah. It, you don't want to drown out the Ibadi voices with and Ibadi scholars within that narrative, within that discussion. Correct. Um, I think it would be, I mean, with the easy communications nowadays, it would be prudent for Western academics, for example, or any academic not to rush to a conclusion before discussing these issues with an Ibadi scholar, for example, or uh, after consulting this with the uh, Ibadi literatures, because nowadays much more books are translated, much more books are published, in fact, unlike in the past, Orientalist Western Academy had to resort to a limited number of manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Much more manuscripts were, uh, I mean, discovered ever since. Much more manuscripts were published and edited. Much more manuscripts were put online nowadays. So um, it would be prudent and why to revise this, I mean, literature, academic Western literature, based on the updated body of scholarship we have. Absolutely. Um... So just to focus a little bit on Abu Yaqub ibn al-Waljani and his role in relation to the Musnad. So, um, so we've established that that the Mus that the the Arabis Musnad predates him. So, but he had a very interesting role in the sixth century. So he he, ha what did he do essentially to Arabis Musnad? How did he reorganize it and why? Yeah, the classical perspective in this regard is that Al-Musnad, as its name suggests, was written based on the companions or the name of the companions. This is the technical meaning of a Musnad, a book, a collection of hadith that was organized based on the names of the narrators, mainly the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the narrations of Aisha, is put uh, uh, separately from the narration of Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, separately from the narrator of Abu Huraira. So there is chunks of narrations based on the narrator. So this, what the word al-Musnad implies. So the role of Abu Sa'id, uh, sorry, Abu Ya'qub al-Wariglani, based on the class classical understanding, is that he rearranged or reorganized Al-Musnad not based on the narrators, but based on the chapters of Al-Fiqh. So, yeah, based on so the chapters of Bahara or first the Revelation or the Wahi, then the Quran, how it is organized, then Talab al-Ilm seeking knowledge, then Wilaya and Imama, uh, then he went into the purification chapters, a number of chapters, prayer, fasting, um, uh, pilgrimage, charity, and so on and so forth. So he reorganized the Muslim based on the chapters of the fiqh rather than the chapters, uh, rather than the names of the companions to be more helpful for the reader. Because at the end of the day, if you establish the authenticity of the book, then it doesn't matter for the average reader who narrated this book as far as or as much as the content mm. of the Musnad. So, and in order for you to make it easy for your reader, then you have to organize it based on the themes or the content of these narrations rather than the narrator himself or herself. So this is okay. so the main role. The thematic reorganization yes and he also put the names of the chapters because they were not there in the original Muslim so he had to um, uh, invent let's say his own titles for the chapters 
or the chunks of hadith that he had to organize and put together. Interesting. So, so the original version of the Musnad, we know we don't have it today, but did it survive after the creation of Arwa Jalini's version, so his Tartib? Did it survive? Do we have evidence that there was the, that, that the original Musnad survived after the creation of his Tartib? And if it did survive, why did the original Musnad sort of lapse out of communal and scholarly use? So obviously, uh, we see a lot of references to the Tartib after Wajalani because that was that version became more and more popular. Um, so, so, so yes, yeah, so that's my question. So, did the original version survive after his Tartib? And then, how did it lapse out of use? Uh, at least we understand from what was mentioned uh, about Al Musnad by later biographers, we understand that it it lasted for a few centuries at least after Rabia from what uh, the later biographers described the original Musnad and the contrast between the original Musnad and uh, the tartib or the reorganization of Abu Yaqub al-Wariglani. For example, a biographer uh, described the original Musnad as mushawash, mushawash in Arabic uh, that means disorganized. So from that, we can understand that he had access, otherwise he wouldn't have given this description to the original Musnad. Another one is Al-Barradi, who was alive at the beginning of the ninth century, also another biographer. He also made like a contrast between the rearrangement of Abu Yaqub al-Wariglani and the original Musnad. So we understand from these references that Al-Musnad might well have lasted for a few centuries after Abu Yaqub al-Wariglani. However, uh, as you said, uh, the original Musnad might have lapsed out uh, and we no longer have it. Uh, maybe because the fact that because the fact that uh, when the public are introduced to a better version, uh, you find the older version is dying away. This, I mean, this is as applicable nowadays as it was in the past. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm interested, so interested in a particular book and a new version of the book or a new edition or a new work for the same book is coming out or has come out, I would buy the new version and I would neglect or ignore sort of ignoring the older version. This applies to to the older, I mean, books, in, especially if having, I mean, if it is so expensive to get hold of a book. So in this, if you have the option of, of uh, having either one, you would have, you would take the updated version. So, Gradually, people started shifting from the older version of the Musnad and started copying the more organized copy of the Musnad, especially the, the older one was described as the Mushawash, which roughly translated as disorganized. So the, the work of Abu Yaqub seems to be uh, more easy for the public re readers. And that's why it was COVID and the original way. That might be a cause why the original one died away. Not hugely, so not hugely surprising phenomenon. Um, okay. um, in terms of the Hadith and the content of the Musnad, so it's it's principally an, an Akida and a Fiqh book. It doesn't really talk about history very much. There's no sort of narrations about historical events. It's Principally, um, a Jewish prudential book. Um, you mentioned um, earlier that uh, that there are sort of ninety-seven or around ninety-seven uh, Afra narrations within the book, so unique narrations that are not found in other books and other schools. Um, so, I obviously don't expect you to go through the ninety-seven 
uh, Afro admirations. But in general, um, obviously we we talked about um, earlier that that other schools have neglected Ibadi books and Ibadi sources. Um, the fact that there are these ninety seven narrations that are considered sahi by the Ibadi school, um, what what benefit would these hadiths bring to the ummah? So. Is there any is there any ones that you can pick out in particular that you feel have beneficial knowledge from the Prophet peace be upon him um, that have been ignored by other schools um, and that and that yeah that could benefit the Ummah in terms of their fiqh or in terms of their aqidah in general? Okay, I will be biased here and I will talk about the very narration that I'm studying right now in my BHB study. Please, please do. Uh, I'm studying a unique narration, one of the Afrad narrations of Rabi' ibn Habib that says, La qirada illa bi'ayn. Literally means there is no mubaraba, a concept in classical Islamic uh, jurisprudence of financial transactions. Qirab or mubaraba, another term, the hadith says qirab, which is the concept used by the people of Hijaz. Mubaraba is the concept used by the people of Iraq. So la qirab, which means no mubaraba, no valid mubaraba. Uh, and mubaraba to, okay, I'll, I'll explain what mubaraba, this is so technical. Sorry, I'm getting so technical. No, no it's okay. So no valid mubaraba, except with ayn, la qiraba illa bi ayn. Ayn, it is not the eye in this context, because ayn in Arabic has multiple meanings. So ayn here means gold or silver. And the hadith says literally no valid mubaraba except uh, that the capital uh, has to be or the principle has to be either golden 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 dinars or silver dirhams. It has to be this classical, I mean, uh, type of currencies during the time of the time of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, golden dinars and uh, silver dirhams. So these are called during the time of the Prophet Ayn, or Ayn is used for uh, the whole uh, term of gold and silver. But in this context, it means gold in dinars or silver dirhams, which means cash in our more modern day concept. So uh, I'll explain, I promise to explain the word of Mubaraba. One of the easiest explanation of the word Qirab or Mubaraba is silent partnership, where one provides the capital and the other provides the labor. So it is a partnership between two or many, where one side provides the capital, the finance, and the other provides the labor and the expertise. And they enter into a partnership and they share the profit based on a pre-agreed pre uh, ratio. And the concept of Mubaraba is the widely used concept in modern day Islamic banking uh, that governs the relationship between the customers, the depositors, and the bank, the Islamic bank. So when you open a savings account, uh, it is, most likely, when you open a saving account in an Islamic bank, it is most likely that you are, that the underlying contract between you and the bank is the Mubaraba contract. I would say 90 or 95% of the savings account in an Islamic bank has the concept of Mubaraba as the underlying uh, classical uh, contract between them. So you are the investor, the depositor, you are providing the capital and the bank invests your, uh, your money. So the importance of this fraud narration, which is found nowhere in the books of Hadith, is that it is tackling an issue in the most widely used contract in modern day Islamic banking system. We have no Hadith about Mubarak, verbal Hadith, I should say, we have no verbal hadith about the concept of Mubaraba uh, in the whole body of hadith literature, except this one in the Musnad of Rabi' despite the fact that this concept is the most widely con used concept in contemporary Islamic banking industry. 
Interesting. So this is the scholarship or the some of the benefits that we may lose by ignoring the narrations of Musnad al-Rabi ibn Habib. And this hadith is just valid as many or as most hadith of the Musnad. It contains this golden chain of narration from Abu Ubaidah Gab, from al rabi Abu Ubaidah and Gabir Zayd, uh, from Ibn Abbas. May Allah be pleased with them all. Beside many, if we come to the jurisprudence of purification, jurisprudence of prayer, so many of them, Hajj, Zakah, Siyam, because these 97 Afrad Hadith are found across the whole Musnad. Across the whole, apart from the abundance, uh, the appendices, apart from the last two parts of the Musnad, because the current work of Tartib is, consists of four parts. We believe the Musnad is the first two parts. Uh, so, and that is around 748 narrations or 42 narration, the first two parts. These afrad are found, the 97 ones are on the first two parts. That is the original work of Arabia. The third volume, it is the Kitab al-Aqidah, which was also written by Arabia, but it was made appendix to the Musnad by Abu Yaqub. Uh, so did he uh, with the uh, fourth uh, part of the Musnad, that contains narrations uh, also uh, related to al rabia Ibn Habib and Marasil Gabir ibn Zayd and Riwayat Abi Ghanim, Bishr ibn Ghanim, Khurasani from Imam Aflah bin Abdul Wahab. So these are the last two parts of Kitab Tartib. They were appendixes added uh, by Abu Yaqub and Wariglani related to the works of al rabia Ibn Habib. Amazing. So the number, Roxana, you mentioned 1,505. That's the four hadith parts, not For the, the whole Tartib, okay. not the first two. Not for the Musnad. The Musnad is just the first two parts, which consist uh, around 732 or 34 narration. Okay. So, yeah, so that, that's really interesting in terms of... um. Like you said, other schools neglecting um other 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 books from other schools. Um, that maybe you know that there are some really useful hadiths that are unique to the to the Masnad that are found in there that that could solve like annoying tricky problems that Correct. we have in the Ummah, uh, whether it's related to financial transactions or purity or wh whatever particular area of fit. Um, I think uh it would be beneficial maybe for for other schools to be a bit more open-minded in terms of looking at the Musnad and maybe finding narrations in there that could, like I said, could solve modern day problems that we have in the Ummah today. Um, uh, Taryn, is there anything you wanted to add? Oh, no. Um, with that, um, all of the questions that I have, uh, that I had, have been answered. Uh, Al Muattasim, uh, Sheikh, if you would like to have the final words, Okay, thank you for giving me the final word. Um, I will just reiterate my what I mentioned earlier that uh, researchers from different uh, schools of law uh, should take the Ibadi literature uh, seriously because, as you mentioned earlier at, the, at your generous introduction, that the Ibadi school is one of the earliest schools of law. If we take into consideration that the spiritual founder of the school, Jabir Nuzayd, died 93 of the Hijra. So uh, when uh, Abu Hanifa, the earliest school of the Sunni schools, was, uh, was uh, 13 years old, taking into account he was born in 80 of the Hijra. Imam Malik, the second earliest, was born in 93. So in the exact same year, uh, Gabir bin Zayd died. Al-Shafi'i was born in 150. And Ahmed bin Hanbal, the latest Sunni school, was born in 164, which makes the Ibadi school of law the earliest among uh, Sunni, also, also compared to Ka'afari and 
they the, the Ibada is still the earliest school of law. So it is worth consulting this literature. And uh, by that, I don't mean to take everything uh, I mean for granted, just take it seriously, investigate, examine, I mean the literature found there, and to make your own mind at the end. This is what we are taught now in academic uh, uh, set, uh, set ups that we need to resort to the original source when I want an opinion from the Maliki school, I wouldn't consult a Shafi'i book. I would go to the Maliki. If I want to consult a Hanbali viewpoint, I would resort to the Hanbali, not to the Ibadi. And vice versa, if I want to consult an Ibadi uh, viewpoint or the life or the legacy or about a big Ibadi figure, I would first go to the Ibadi literature. Then I may go to other literature uh, to make my own mind at the end of the day. So this is my final words, is to take Ibadi scholarship seriously and examining and investigating them, especially in issues related to the figures associated with the school or uh, compendiums, books, writings associated with the Ibadi school of law. All right, and thank you for that, Sheikh Al Muatasim Al Muawali. Um, your contribution to this discussion has been invaluable, and we hope to speak to you again on a later date when uh, maybe after your PhD is published, uh, and yeah. you know you might give us an exclusive podcast concerning that, and maybe we can get into the banking or the hadith that uh, deals with Islamic banking and stuff like that because that is sounds like a very interesting topic, and the hadith. Uh, I I, I mean, I won't go any more into and drag our time out anymore. We've spent quite a uh, quite a lot of time taking up your time already, and um, I just want to thank you again. And assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roxana, as well for the invitation. Mm -hmm.